Well, good afternoon. This is Pastor Donaldson, as you might well know, and I just wanted to uh, do a Bible study on today because of the inclement weather. Don't want anybody out here in this uh, bad weather. And so um, hopefully you will tune in at some point and get this Bible study that we will be uh, going over. This will be the evening Bible study, the seven uh, o'clock Bible study. And so we're glad that you tuned in and um, you can share this with uh, your friends and your family. And we are in the book of Ruth. Uh, we started the book of Ruth in introduction on last week. And so we'll recap um, the introduction. On last week, we concluded with verse 13. Uh, today, we will be going through verse 14 all the way through the end of this chapter, which is... Uh, to verse 22. But as always, before we uh, get into the word, we want to uh, pray and ask God's blessing. Um, if you have comments or questions, if you could put those down in the comment section, and I will do my very best to answer those questions, um, not necessarily during the study, but uh, after this study is concluded. So, um, all that having been said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for showing yourself as Jehovah uh, Jireh. Lord, you are the God who provides, and we thank you so much for your provision. Lord, as we uh, open your word, we pray that your spirit will teach us and, and guide us and lead us into all truth. God, we pray that we don't just get a cerebral understanding, but that this word will uh, challenge our hearts and, and, Lord, move us to a place of trust in you. Lord, we want to know you in a very real way. Uh, we pray right now that your spirit would use this, your servant, and that you would give a clarity and open our eyes and give us direction. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, welcome. We wanna thank you for uh, watching and, and tuning in. And again, you could um, tag your friends or your family as we will be going through the book of Ruth. Uh, so if you turn to the book of Ruth on uh, last week, we did somewhat of an it, um, uh, introduction to the book, book of Ruth with some of the history, and I'll just briefly go over some of those uh, facts, and then we will uh, get into the text. And so, first of all, uh, Ruth reveals really God's providence. Uh, the book of Ruth talks about God's providence in the details of life. Now, of course, as we look at our own lives and 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 sometimes God allows things, uh, negative things that we will consider a negative to happen in our lives. But reading through the book of, of Ruth, it reminds us that God providentially uh, takes care of us. And he allows us to make detours in life. He allows things to happen in our lives. And sometimes we don't understand them. Uh, but ultimately, we know, according to Paul, that God will work all things out for the good to those who love the Lord and for those who are called to those who are called according to his purpose. The definition of a short definition of providence is uh, the protective care of God. And so that's the idea that no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, that God is my protector. Um, the theological word says that he is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. And so as we read through this book and study this book, we certainly will see God manifest himself as Jehovah Jireh. We also will see him uh, manifest himself as Jehovah Ra, which is the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, God will manifest himself as a provider, and we will see through the book of Ruth that he is orchestrating behind the scenes. He is, 
He is the, the great shepherd. He is leading them to a place of uh, green pasture. Um, we learn a, f a lot of, uh, about the character of God uh, through this. Remember uh, that this woman lost her husband and her two children. We will see God revealed as Jehovah Rapha, God who is our healer. And so introduction-wise, let me just throw out a few facts. Again, first of all, the purpose of this book, of the book of Ruth, is God's providence in the details of life. And providence is the protective care of God. God is our protector. Um, the time frame was uh, 1011 to 971. This was really during the time of the judges. Um, judges 17 verse 6 says this, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own heart, in his own eyes. And so this was during the time of the judges. Um, of course, as we read through the book of Samuel, we are actually preaching through the book of Samuel um, right around verse chapter 7, chapter 8. They decide that they do not want to be um, under the theocratic rule of God, and so they want to be like those who are around them. I would caution uh, the churches and those that represent God to um, resist the temptation to be like those who are around you. Um, in fact, in the New Testament, Paul says of the believers that you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation. You are people who belong to God. The word uh, holy is hagias. Uh, it's the idea of being separate, being apart, being distinct, not like everybody else. And so we see during the time of the judges, they were looking at the nations around them, and they decided that they were not satisfied. Ultimately, they were not satisfied with God's rule and they wanted to be like the nations around them. And ironically, God granted them their wish. And then as we know, it, it didn't turn out well. He actually told them what would happen and then we see it unfold through the book of uh, 1 Samuel. As I said in verse one of Ruth, it lets us know that um, the time period now came about in the days when the judges govern. Now, when the judges govern, according to the book of Judges, um, there was a spiritual decline. Uh, there was uh, moral depravity. There was uh, disobedience. Uh, they desired to be like the Canaanites, the nations around them. There was idolatry. There was a lot of intermarrying, and anytime God, um, we said this on last week, anytime God uh, allowed the children of Israel to go to a different place, he would tell them, don't intermarry, don't marry their women, because their, their women will turn your heart away from me. So that was a constant cry out to God, and you see God depicted as a, as a jealous uh, husband, uh, to his children, Israel. And it was common uh, with moral depravity. There was rebellion and there was a turning away from God that was a cycle. If you remember in the book of Judges, there was always uh, the children of Israel were delivered into bondage. That was the first part of the cycle. And then they would pray and cry out to God while they were in bondage. God would send a deliverer to get them out of bondage. They would experience a time of peace and prosperity and God's blessing, and only to run right back into the cycle all over again. Uh, we've got to uh, really look at the judges and, and, and assess our own lives and don't continue these same cycles in life. And, um, and so we learn that even as we go through these cycles, God is faithful. He is Jehovah Ra. He is our shepherd. And even though he allows us to go to places of, of bondage, 
because of our rebellion, he is constantly leading us out to uh, greener pastures. So that is the time of, of the judges. Uh, this story has of Ruth has a window of about mm, 10, to, uh, 10 to 12 year time period. Uh, the author is um, unknown, but many suggest that it is Samuel that is the author of this book. Um, Ruth looks back almost 900 years to the events of the time of Jacob, and then, then it looks forward to 100 years to the coming reign of David and ultimately uh, to the coming of the Messiah. As you know, Ruth is in the messianic line and it's um, prov God's providence that she would be in the messianic line. And that's uh, highlighted in um, Matthew chapter one, verse five, when we look at Christ's uh, genealogy. There were a few other things, uh, themes that pops up in, in the book of Ruth. Number one, and these notes actually, this portion comes from uh, John MacArthur in his study um, notes. Uh, Ruth the Moabitess illustrates that God's redemptive plan extended beyond the Jews to Gentiles. Now that's very important because this is really one of the, the, one of the first books that highlights salvation uh, coming to non-Jews. I've said this before, that it was always God's redemptive plan to redeem all mankind. Uh, Israel was his chosen instrument to be a representation of him to the world. Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 talks about uh, God's plan for Israel. It was, um, it was always God's plan to use Israel as a billboard to display God's glory. And of course, they were a rebellious people. And because of their rebellion, again, they would go through these cycles. But ultimately, in the book of Ruth, we see God use, providentially use a tragedy to save a Moabitess, um, who were the arch enemies of Israel, and showing that God's uh, salvation and his redemption extends not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. That's the first thing. Secondly, Ruth shows that women are co-heirs with men and God's salvation grace. Women are co-heirs with men and God's salvation grace. We are, there is neither Jew, and according to Galatians, and neither the Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, bond nor free, uh, we are one in Christ. In other words, we are saved in the same way. Women are not saved differently than men. Men are not superior to women in the sense that we are saved. We are both uh, morally depraved um, in our humanity, and we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone in the same way, Okay. In Galatians, uh, this verse is quite often used as a proof text for women um, in leadership. Ruth shows that God has always used women in leadership. Now, that's a whole different argument when we talk about women pastoring and women apostles and, and so on and so forth. That's on another day, on another time. But Ruth ultimately is showing that women are co-heirs with men in God's salvation grace. Thirdly, Ruth portrays the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. Um, she just picture, she just really portrays that very, very beautifully. Um, as you look at her life, as you look at her commitment um, to her mother-in-law and um, her really abandoning her culture in the sense that she would abandon um, the, the the gods of her day, and we'll see we'll see this um, come up as we go and get into the text. Um, and she says, "Your people are going to be my people, and your God will become my God." So that's where we get the idea of the uh, Gentile uh, conversion. Um, so Ruth portrays a virtuous woman 
um, of Proverbs 31, starting at verse 11. Fourth, Ruth describes God's sovereign providential care. I shared that earlier. Um, there is a famine in the land, and, um, and, so God, and, and there are widows. And so God providentially cares for these women, and we'll see how that unfolds as we go through the book of Ruth. Uh, ultimately, um, God reveals himself as a provider for Ruth and Naomi. Uh, and, and, and so we, we, we see a manifestation of God's grace and God manifesting himself through the book of Ruth um, as Jehovah Jireh. Ironically, uh, the book of Ruth, you don't see the name of God, but you do see his fingerprint all through this book. You see his, um, his sovereign grace working, his direction as a shepherd. You see him um, showing himself uh, providentially through uh, circumstances through this particular book. Uh, fifth, the book of Ruth shows how God providentially used, listen, Ruth, Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba and the Messianic line. And so it's a, it's a bad argument to say that God does not use women. Uh, we're not talking about offices in the church. We're talking about how God sovereignly, providentially use women. And these women, um, ironically, are in the Messianic line. And so that's one of the themes. Um, the, sixth, um, the sixth theme is Boaz is a type of Christ becoming the kinsman redeemer for uh, Ruth. And Christ, of course, is the redeemer of all mankind for those that would uh, trust in him. So Boaz becomes somewhat of a type of Christ in the sense that he redeemed uh, a Ruth from the position where she was, and, and now she has a safety and protection and provision through the Redeemer, um, Boaz. And of course, we have those same things through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The last thing is uh, David's right to the throne going back to uh, Judah. So we said on last week, uh, the book of uh, First and Second uh, Samuel, First and Sam Second Samuel are actually one particular book, but we see Ruth kind of come in during the time of David. Um, as, as I said before, maybe a 10 to 12, 12 year uh, time period where Ruth is kind of, um, her story is, is snuggled within that time period. And so let's, uh, let's just go ahead and that's a little bit of the history. Let's just go ahead and quickly get into the text. I don't want to take um, a long time, uh, but I do want to be thorough as we go through this chapter. Again, if you have questions, please put your questions in the comments and I will try to address those questions um, after we um, get off of the, the live chat. Uh, first, uh, verse one. Uh, now it came about in the days, and again, on last week, we went through verse 13, so I'll be quickly going through verses 1 through 13, just highlighting a few uh, uh, things. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed, Judges chapter uh, 17, verse 6, says that they did what was right in their own minds. There was no uh, king... Um, in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own mind. So, so that's the the background. It's a kind of a rebellious, uh, idolatrous time, and I, you know, a whole lot of um, just rebellion against God. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. That's the first problem. And now, this scenario, you'll see this as it goes along. This famine will providentially lead them from Moab to 
a place where they could get food. And that's where the redemption takes place. And so there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem of Judea went to sojourn in the in the land of Moab. So because of the famine, he went to Moab. And again, remember, Moab were the enemies of Israel. He went with, according to verse 1b, he went with his wife and his two sons. So the name of the man, verse 2, was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were, were Malhan and Chilion, Epaphrites uh, of Bethlehem and Judea. So that tells where they were from. They were from Bethlehem in Judea. They had sojourned to Moab because there was a famine in the land. Um, God providentially allowed the famine to happen. So they leave. And then, as we'll see, circumstances are going to bring them back. Okay. It says, now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Verse 3, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. And so to make matters worse, there's a famine in the land. Naomi is married. Her husband takes her to Moab and her two sons, so it's she and her two sons at this time, and then her husband died. And it says she was left with her two sons. While they were still there, it says, they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. Now remember, uh, God always told the children of Israel or the children of Judah that when you go to these places, do not marry their women. But as we see, they took women, Moabite women, who again were enemies of Israel. They took these women as their wives. And then it gives a name in verse 4. The names of the one is Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. And we'll see that Ruth will become the main character in this whole uh, plot. And they lived there about 10 years. So... Naomi, her husband dies. She has two sons. Her sons get married after the father dies. So it's now Naomi, her two sons, and her two daughters-in-laws. And it says, and they lived there about 10 years. Okay. Then both of then both Malhan and Chilion also died. And so now we are leaving Ruth and these two daughters-in-laws. And we said on last week, there, there are times when, as people of God, things happen in our lives, and we, we kind of question, where is God? Or even, why is God not uh, hearing my prayer? Or why is he allowing these things to happen in my life? And remember, the book of Ruth is a book on God's providence. Uh, we know in Romans 8.28, everybody quotes it. It's a, a reality because we know that God is working all things out together for good to those who love God and, and, and are called according to his purpose. But when we're going through the issues of life, when life is squeezing us, when life is pressing us, uh, it's normal for us to feel like we feel. And I say at almost every funeral, it's okay for you to be disappointed because God is able to handle your disappointments. So at this point, Malion in verse 5 and Chilion died, and the women were bereft of her two children, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. So she's a widow. She lost her husband, and she lost her two children. And this is one of the reasons uh, why we know that uh, the Bible is not uh, man-ordained um, in the sense that you, you wouldn't write this in. You wouldn't write in all this negativity 
for the people of God. And so we see how God works even through the negative details of, of life. Now the plot begins to thicken. It says in verse six, then she arose, that is of course, Naomi. She arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So somehow she heard that in uh, Judah, there was, um, there was, God had obviously allowed a, a rain to come and there was, there was food. And so she decided because she's a widow and she's lost her sons, that it's probably best if I go back home. And so she heard that the Lord had visited his people, giving them food. So naturally, verse seven, so she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Okay. And remember, they left Judah at, um, they left Judah, but, and there was a famine in the land. So it says, God um, had blessed his people. In effect, he visited his people in verse uh, six. And so verse eight says, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house. Now, again, remember Naomi had developed a relationship with these two women because her husband had passed away after their, uh, her husband passed, her two sons married. And so it says that they were there um, about 10 years. I read that somewhere. Um, so it says that they were there about 10 years. So over that time, uh, there was a, a development of relationship. And so no doubt that these uh, women grew fond of each other. They grew close because they had a common, they had a common wound. Uh, Naomi had lost her husband and they lost their husbands too. But Naomi not only lost her husband, but she lost her children. And so these were broken uh, women. These were women that were, that were hurting deeply hurting, and to add insult to injury, not only were they widows and deeply emotionally uh, hurting and wounded, they were, they were poor and basically destitute, and they, they really had no means of, of getting food. So it made sense for Naomi to go back home. And so verse 8, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house, which is a place of safety as well as provision. Go home where you've got safety and where you've got provision. And she says, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And basically what she's doing is she's giving them a blessing to go back home. These women, the ages um, are not told, but later on we'll know. We'll uh, Naomi will talk about she's old. She's not. She's past the the uh, childbearing age. So she encourages them to go back to your own home. Go back to uh, get your provision, and perhaps while you're there, you can marry and have children. Now, you don't note that these women had children. Um, because they probably did not have children at the time. And to be married and not be able to have children was, was not a good thing. It was almost a, um, looked at as a sign of, of God's cursing you. We, in the book of 1 Samuel, we see uh, Hannah, when she uh, prayed uh, for God to uh, give her a child and her um, husband's uh, wife uh, kind of got at her, you know, from time to time, uh, you know, about her not being able to, to bear children. So ultimately God uh, opens the womb of Hannah 
And in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah writes a praise to God, which is was awesome. And so if you could read that on your own, 1 Samuel chapter 2, I believe the first um, 10 or 11 verses talks about Hannah's praise. But ultimately, she tells, Naomi tells these two daughter-in-laws, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Verse nine, may the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. And so she's asking or basically promoting peace in their life and giving them a blessing to go back home. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Um, just in my own mind, how difficult that would have been to see Naomi uh, lose her husband, um, grieve over her husband, see the joy of her sons marrying, um, only to see her sons die. Um, and then watching their wives grieve um, over the loss of their husbands, as well as take care of her. So there is a, a no doubt, a strong bond between these women. And so leaving, um, even though there's a, uh, a chance of things getting better for them because they're young women, they are really tied to Naomi. Uh, something that is really underlying also uh, that may be hidden um, as a woman of God, Naomi must have had a great influence on these young women. These were uh, pagan women. They were Gentiles. They did not know God, but God sovereignly orchestrated the intermarriage. Even though God would not want it, have wanted them to do so, God still works providentially to show these women who God is. And this becomes important as we read on into the story. And so no doubt they're close to this woman and she has exhibited a Proverbs 31, a virtuous woman. Um, so they've seen that. They've seen her relationship with God. And uh, so I would say her walk walked much louder than her talk talked. So we could talk about God and we could talk about our love for God, but ultimately how we live, how we walk out our faith, it says a whole lot more about what we really believe in the core of our being. So she tries to send them away. And of course, in verse nine, she blesses them and then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept as you might expect. Okay. They said in verse 10, and they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. That's significant. Now, again, this is the first time that we see scripturally where um, there is somewhat of an extension, an invitation. Naomi is telling them to go away, but they are, because of their relationship with her, because of their influence with her, because of their common wounds with her, um, they don't want to go home. They says, we will surely return with you to your people. But verse 11, Naomi said, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb? In other words, I am a well past childbearing age. Even if I wasn't, it's going to take some time for me to have some children and, and then they get old enough to marry. Listen to what she says. Why should you go home with me? Have I yet sons in my womb and they may be your husband's rhetorical question? No. Return my daughters. Go for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I could even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they are grown? She's saying, listen, 
ladies, you, you, you're you young and you have an opportunity to start all over again. Um, you have an opportunity to get uh, your, meet, your needs met uh, by husbands providing protection and so on, you you can do that. I'm going back home. Uh, you don't need to go home with me. Go to your own home. He says, would you therefore remain refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Now, that's interesting. And I love the fact that Naomi is being honest. That is exactly how she is feeling. She is feeling like the hand of the Lord is against her. Um, much like uh, Job felt like the hand of the Lord was against him. Much like many of us, when we go through difficult times in life, we feel like, the hand of the Lord is against us. And she verbalizes this. She says this. She doesn't spiritualize. Listen, she does not spiritualize her hurt. She says, the Lord, the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And so here's what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that if you are hurting, if you are wounded, if you're in a place in life where you feel like God has forsaken you. I'm suggesting that you be honest about that. I'm suggesting that you not spiritualize your hurt. I'm suggesting that um, when people come to you and, and tell you God is taking one of his flowers and they're with the angels and um, so on and so forth. And, and if they're believers in Jesus Christ and they died, then yes, they, they're present with the Lord, but it still doesn't, it doesn't heal that, that hurt, that wound, uh, is still there. And as believers, we can be honest with God about what's going on in our hearts. Um, I won't go there, but Psalm 13, again, is, is one of my favorite Psalms because, David is being very real with God about what's going on in his his circumstances, how he feels. And, and he begins that song with a, a several how long, O oh Lord, how long, how long, how long. And, and but he ends by saying, um, I'm going to praise you. He makes himself, in spite of his circumstances, Give God the praise that is due his name. We see that same type of response um, of Hannah when she prayed and and um, she went to Eli and Eli thought she was drunk and in and, and chapter one of first Samuel and 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 she leads and she goes to worship. And some years later, she's bringing Hannah. I mean, she's bringing uh, Samuel. To, to Eli, the priest, and say, hey, listen, uh, several years ago, you remember when I was praying, you may not remember, but I was praying and um, you blessed me. And, and I told you if the Lord uh, would grant me a son, I would give him back to him. So here he is. And so she was faithful. Ruth chapter one, verse 14. Remember, she says, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Verse 14, and they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. That's powerful. Orpha, uh, I don't think there was anything uh, bad about Orpha leaving because Naomi, just out of respect for Naomi, she went on and decided that she would go back to her home, to her people. Um, but ironically, uh, sovereignly, uh, providentially, the text says that Ruth clung to her. It's like, she says, I, I, can't, I can't leave you. The relationship, the bond was so tight that she said, um, all of who I am, my my culture, uh, my people, 
I am going to abandon all of that to be with you. And this is God's sovereign work in her life. Verse 15, it says, Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Now remember, telling them to go back was basically they are, their people were the enemies of, of Judah, of Israel. Um, they were people who did not know the God of Israel. They did not have a relationship with the God of Israel. But here we see, she says, uh, Naomi says to her, then she said, behold, in verse 15, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Verse 16, but Ruth said, listen, this is the intensity. This is the depth of that relationship. And the impact, listen, the impact of the influence of a godly woman. Let me just say that again. That is the impact and the influence of a godly woman. Um, for those who are, are watching or those who are watch in, in time to come, uh, don't think that people are not looking at you. Don't, ladies, you say, well, these girls don't want to listen. Well, maybe they are listening, but they're listening to your behavior more than they're listening to your talk, to your words. And so it's important that you understand that living the life is more important than talking about the life. And so we see that influence in the life of Naomi, I mean, of uh, Ruth, verse 16 again. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Basically, she's saying, listen, I'm ride or die. We're going, you know, this is ride or die. The influence that you've had on my life is such that um, where you go, I'm going. Where you die, that's what, I mean, I'm, I'm sold out um, because of this relationship. And I would say this has to do with her lifestyle and how she has treated these um, foreign unbelievers, these Gentile women who were enemies of Israel. He says, your people shall, listen, your people shall be my people and your God, my God. <laughs> now, to me, that is just quite powerful. Your God is going to be my God. I know when we got married, I had a belief system and, and we served our gods, in fact, um, Ruth, I'm sorry, Naomi understands this. And she says basically to her in verse 15, um, go back to your people and your gods and return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth says, no, no, your God is, is going to be my God. Your people is going to be my people. Now, verse 17 she says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Um, listen, you can stop talking. You can stop trying to influence me. She say, um, will you die? I'm going to die also. Verse 18, when she saw that she was determined, to go with her, she said no more to her. And so obviously Ruth um, had a strong will to the point where Naomi says, listen, I, um, you know, I'm convinced and um, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna try to fight you on this. Verse 18. Verse 19, it says, so they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. 
Now, as I read this, I thought, why would the city be stirred because of them? Well, perhaps knowing that there was a, a famine in the land, um, that perhaps could have stirred them up. Secondly, uh, it, it may have been because they knew and were very familiar with Naomi. Um, they perhaps had heard that um, Naomi's sons had married uh, Moabite women. And so the text is not real clear about why they were stirred up, um, but ultimately they are. It says, so they, in verse 19, so they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Now, again, you can look at this a few ways. Um, you can look at this as, um, hey, there's Naomi. Or because of all that Naomi had gone through, um, it certainly would have uh, changed her appearance in some type of way. You know, grief has a way of, of doing that. Um, and, I, and to add to that, there was a famine in the land. So maybe the way people remembered Naomi, um, she looked so different. And so they are questioning, and is, is that, is that Naomi? Um, I think that the latter is probably the case, where they looked at Naomi and they, they questioned if it was her because she just did not look like herself because of the grief, because of the famine. Um, and so look at how she responds. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, which means uh, in Hebrew pleasant, but call me Mara, which means bitter. Remember, names mean something um, in the Bible. So her name means pleasant. Um, it somewhat summarizes probably her demeanor as it relates to her relationship to her daughters-in-law. She was pleasant with them. She wasn't mean or, or vindictive. And uh, there's always stories about the mother-in-laws. and um, But Naomi was... She was Naomi. She was pleasant to these women. But she describes herself after they looked at her and said, is, I mean, is that really Naomi? She says, don't call me Naomi, but call me bitter. Call me bitter. Why? For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. There again. She's being honest about how she feels, and she's not, she's not spiritualizing it. She's telling it the way she feels. She says, you know, God has dealt bitterly with me. Verse 21, she says, I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. I love that. She's not... She's not beating around the bush. I left, and maybe y'all could see this in me. She says, I left full, but the Lord has brought me back em empty. Why do you call me pleasant? Or why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has, listen, witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. You know, we were raised to... Um, think uh, that well, you don't ever question God or you don't ever talk negative about God. Um, I've said this, and I'll say it again. God can handle your disappointments. I think probably the first step to you being healed, uh, the first step to you really experiencing God as Jehovah Rapha, the God who healeth thee, 
is being honest about what's going on in your heart. And because he is omniscient, which means that he knows all, he already knows your heart. So it's okay for you to be honest with God about what's actually going on in your heart. And that's what she feels. She says, why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned and with her Ruth, um, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And so now we see they're there. Uh, Naomi is recognized. Um, I believe she is uh, noticeably uh, different as in her appearance because of the famine and because of the grief. Um, and so now she's there at the right time. Uh, and it is the beginning of the barley harvest. And that's um, the middle uh, of April, somewhere around there, the barley harvest. And so there's provision, there's food there in Bethlehem. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here uh, and we can um, check back next week and then we will see how this, this story uh, un unfolds, how God providentially cares for Naomi as well as Ruth. What do we leave with today? Uh, Ruth is loyal. Ruth ultimately has committed to follow following a Naomi's God, what does it say to us? Know that people are watching you. Know that people are looking at how you handle difficult times and how you handle difficult times as a believer it says a whole lot about your faith and ultimately it says a whole lot more about the God that you say you have faith in. Father in heaven, we come in Jesus' name. We know that you are El Shaddai. You are the all-sufficient one. Lord, I thank you for this lesson showing how you are Jehovah Ra. You are the shepherd of your people. And we thank you for your provision. As we read through this story, the difficulty in Naomi's life, I thank you that you were able to show us that it's okay for us to be honest with you about our hurts and about our disappointments. Lord, we have emotions and you have made us emotional beings. Naomi feels like your hand was against her and that you've witnessed against her and you've afflicted her. But we know the rest of the story. And so we thank you in advance for the reminder that even though we can't see your hand at times, but we can trust your heart, you will take care of your people. For you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God who will provide. So we honor you and we bless you. Lord, build our faith to trust you in difficult times. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for watching. And if you would uh, tag your friends, if you have questions or uh, comments, you can put those in the, um, in the comments below and I will do my best to get back uh, answer those as quickly as possible. Be blessed and have a beautiful day. Amen.